I would like to welcome you all in my capacity as, as the chairman of the Council of the Hague Conference Private National Law to this uh, day of celebration here at the Hague Peace Palace premises. Today here it is not for me uh, to talk but rather uh, the others and, and uh, it is therefore that uh, after, after uh, presenting the persons here on the podium I will give the word uh, and the floor to others. Uh, here at the podium on my left hand side is Her Excellency uh, Susanna uh, Ruiz Ceruti and uh, uh, Director General for Consular Affairs and Operational Management uh, and Deputy Secretary General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, uh, Ms. Monique uh, van Dalen. And then on my right-hand side, uh, His Excellency Rimsky Yuen Kogoing. I would like to welcome you all. I would like to welcome you all, uh, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to this uh, day of celebration of uh, 120 years of the Hague Conference. And with that, and without more from my side, I would like to give the floor to uh, Ms. Monique uh, van Dalen. Please. Excellencies, Mr. Secretary General, ladies and gentlemen. Frans Timmermans, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, is unfortunately not able here to, to open the, the celebration of the 120th anniversary of the Hague Conference. He has asked me to address you in his place. The reason that Mr. Timmermans cannot be present is that he is accompanying Russian President Vladimir Putin, who is visiting the Netherlands this afternoon. Voilà un de ces nombreux moments où les chemins de l'histoire se croisent à nouveau. Je vous raconterai pourquoi un peu plus tard. In 1883, the first Hague Conference on Private International Law took place in The Hague under the leadership of Dutchman Tobias Asser. Asser believed that legal conflicts between different national systems could best be solved by international conferences, which would agree common solutions to be implemented by each participating nation. C'est à lui et à tous ses collègues venus du monde entier conscient de l'importance de cette initiative, que nous devons de célébrer aujourd'hui le 120e anniversaire de la Conférence de l'AE. The choice of The Hague as the site of this international conference had major positive consequences for the Netherlands. It led to The Hague being chosen as the site for the peace conferences of 1899 and 1907. Interestingly, to return to the Russian connection, the Russian Tsar Nicholas II chose The Hague at the suggestion of his legal advisor, Fedor de Martins, who had attended the first two sessions of the Hague Conference on Private International Law. The peace conferences produced international agreements on peaceful settlement of disputes. This led to the establishment of the Permanent Court of Arbitration for which the Peace Palace was first built. Later, the UN's International Court of Justice would make it its home here as well. In August of this year, we will celebrate the 100th anniversary of the opening of the Peace Palace. Tobias Asser's idea of finding mutually acceptable solutions to conflicts is still central to the work of the Hague Conference today. The conference's efforts to promote the international legal order and the rule of law worldwide reflect this same thinking. But simply devising new rules is no longer a sufficient means to this end. Today, the Center for Judicial Studies and Technical Assistance allows the Hague Conference to help build its members build their national legal expertise and capacity. This facilitates the implementation of major Hague Conventions and so strengthens the international legal order. En tant que directrice générale des affaires consulaires, je suis à même de donner quelques exemples où se croise le travail de la Conférence de l'AE 
et les pratiques quotidiennes du ministère néerlandais des Affaires étrangères. Take the Apostille Convention. The Convention abolishing the requirements of legalization of foreign public documents, which is crucial for us. Since 1965, this convention has made moving to another country easier for the nationals of dozens of states. By replacing the legalization of a whole series of official documents with one stamp, the apostille. Children's interests also play a central role in the Hague Conventions, notably in matters of adoption and of child ab abduction. In principle, adoption from countries that are party to the Hague Inter-Country Adoption Convention is automatically recognized in the Netherlands. This means that procedures in these countries are generally quicker and more reliable, certainly compared to what happens when a child is adopted from a country that is not party to the convention. Those adoptions are not automatically recognized. This can lead to complex, time-consuming and sometimes distressing situations. So it is in all our interests for as many countries as possible to accede to this convention. Since 1990, the Netherlands has also been party to the Convention on the Civil Aspects of International Child Abduction. We always treat cases of uh, child abduction the same way, whether countries are party to the Convention or not. At the request of the Netherlands Central Authority, my ministry acts as a mediator in cases of child abduction to countries that are not party to the Convention, and occasionally even to parties that to countries that are. There seems to be a felt need for more exchanges of experience among the different state parties about the procedures to be followed. In the interest of the children, it is vital that time limits laid down in the Convention be respected as much as possible. Les Pays-Bas soutiennent pleinement les efforts de la Conférence de la Haye en matière de mise en œuvre des conventions. C'est un travail de longue haleine qui demande la coopération des pays membres ainsi que l'implication de la particip sa participation de chacun. C'est en joignant nos efforts que nous verrons vraiment notre travail porter ses fruits. And in the work that lies ahead for the conference, it can count on the continued support of the Netherlands as its host country. Later this year, we will join together to mark the departure on the 1st of July of Dutchman Hans van Loon, as Secretary General of the Conference, after years of hard work and great dedication. We are glad that the successful open hiring process has led to the appointment of a worthy successor, the current Deputy Secretary General Christophe Bernasconi. I can assure you that the Netherlands support will be ongoing. Pour conclure, Permettez-moi de vous transmettre le message de félicitations personnelles de France Témoins à la Conférence de l'AE à l'occasion de son anniversaire. Quote. On behalf of the Dutch government, it is my pleasure to congratulate the Council on General Affairs and Policy, the Permanent Bureau and the staff of the Hague Conference on Private International Law on their many achievements during the organization's first 120 years. Thanks to all your valuable and dedicated work and the support of the Member States, the Hague Conference has become a key global player in international commercial and civil matters. I wish you every success in achieving the goals you have set for the next 120 years. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madame Dahlen, for these words of introduction. And indeed, uh, thank you on behalf of the Council and the members of the conference uh, to, to the uh, uh, government of the Netherlands uh, for this support that you have provided for the conference for now 120 years and also the support that will be continuing, you promised, for the next 120 years. Uh, thank you very much, uh, as it is quite in indispensable for the, for the conference. Uh, and for any organization of this sort that there is uh, a full commitment uh, uh, from the whole state to provide everything that needs to be provided 
for the functioning of the, of the organization. That certainly is uh, what has happened in, in the case of the Hague Conference and, and the government of the Netherlands. Thank you for that. Um, as uh, Madame Darren uh, noted, and as, as we all know, uh, the Hague Conference started out as, as, a, as a European organization, uh, uh, a regional organization. It has grown, grown and uh, uh, become very much a global player. Uh, with increasing, uh, accel accelerating speed during the last uh, 10, 20 years. Uh, and it is this side of things that uh, is to be highlighted now in the next two uh, uh, speeches uh, that will be provided by, uh, by our keynote speakers uh, on the impact of the Hague Conference in two important regions of, of our world. And uh, in relation to the Latin American region, I would now like to give the floor to uh, uh, Her Excellency uh, Susanna Ruiz Ceruti. The floor is yours, please. Madame the Secretary General Adjoint du Ministère des Affaires étrangères, Monsieur le Secretaire à la Justice de Hong Kong, Monsieur le Secretaire General de la Conférence, Mesdames et Messieurs le Représentant des États membres de la Conférence, Mesdames et Messieurs. J'aimerais tout d'abord féliciter les membres du bureau permanent et tous les fonctionnaires des États qui sont liés aux travaux de la conférence et qui ont su, grâce à leur engagement permanent, préserver fortement et pleinement le dynamisme de cette organisation. Je souhaiterais également remercier l'occasion qui m'est donnée de pouvoir partager avec vous Certains des aspects saillants concernant la présence de la conférence en Amérique latine. En effet, nous n'avons pas souvent l'honneur de participer à une cérémonie commémorant les 120 années d'existence d'un organisme international. Dans le cas de la conférence, son origine, son histoire et sa situation actuelle lui confère un lieu spécial parmi les acteurs de la communauté internationale. Examiner les plus de 100 années d'histoire de la conférence de l'AE, c'est aussi reconnaître le chemin jalonné de succès que ces membres ont parcouru pour qu'elle soit au cœur du développement du droit international privé, en œuvrant en vue de son unification à vocation universelle et pour faciliter la vie des millions de ressortissants des États qui la composent. Le XXe siècle a été défini comme le siècle de la mondialisation, des mouvements migratoires massifs, où les rapports entre les personnes et les familles sont passés à l'échelle internationale. Un rythme sans précédent dans l'histoire de l'humanité, en soumettant ces liens aux règlements juridiques les plus variés. Les défis des États au XXe siècle, qui s'appliquent encore plus au XXe siècle, a été de garantir une plus grande sécurité juridique et d'apporter des solutions justes et équitables à des situations sui generis occasionnées par les mouvements internationaux des individus. La coopération et la codification du droit international privé se sont avérés être des outils adaptés pour atteindre ces objectifs. Et la conférence de l'AE en particulier est devenue, au fil de ces 120 années d'existence, un forum qui a réussi à unifier les règles du droit international privé dans le domaine de la coopération judiciaire et administrative internationale, de la protection des enfants et de la famille, et sur certaines questions liées au droit commercial. À cet égard, c'est un honneur pour moi d'avoir aujourd'hui la possibilité de me référer aux travaux de l'organisation en Amérique latine, l'une des premières régions au monde à avoir compris le besoin de travailler entre États pour garantir une harmonisation efficace des règles du droit international privé. Le traité de Montevideo et les conférences spécialisées interaméricaines du droit international privé organisées dans le cadre de l'Organisation des États américains, 
sont autant de contributions fondamentales des pays américains au droit international privé, y compris les dispositions qui ont permis des avancées scientifiques incontestables. Ces expériences ont démontré de manière catégorique que lorsque les activités sont liées les uns les unes aux autres par des liens culturels, géographiques et linguistiques spéciaux, elles ont plus de chances au niveau régional d'être couronnées de succès. À ce propos, en 2005, le programme spécial de la Conférence pour les États latino-américains a été créé afin de promouvoir la participation des pays de la région à ces travaux. Monsieur Ignacio Boicochea, ancien membre de l'autorité centrale argentine, créée au terme de la Convention de la Haye de 1981, a été nommé collaborateur juridique de liaison pour l'Amérique latine, afin de répondre à la demande croissante de formation spécialisée et d'orientation de la part du gouvernement sur l'application et la mise en œuvre de, <coughs> des instruments de la conférence. Le premier succès du programme a mis en évidence la nécessité et la pertinence de créer une extension du bureau permanent dans la région. Et c'est ainsi qu'est né le bureau régional pour l'Amérique latine, dont le siège se trouve à Buenos Aires. La principale fonction du bureau régional est d'augmenter la visibilité dans la région de la conférence et des conventions signées sous sa loi. Le fait que la langue de travail soit l'espagnol permet d'avoir un accès direct aux acteurs du secteur public et privé des pays latino-américains, en apportant une assistance technique et en contribuant à l'application appropriée et au fonctionnement des Convention de l'AE. De même, son existence a accru la coopération intrarégionale en rapprochant de nouveaux pays aux travaux de la conférence. Depuis sa création en 2005, trois pays, le Paraguay, l'Équateur et le Costa Rica, sont devenus membres de la conférence, tandis qu'un quatrième pays, la Colombie, va d'ici peu faire de même. De plus, 11 ratifications latino-américaines à différentes conventions de l'AE ont été reçues. Il est également important de souligner que le bureau régional a renforcé les rapports entre la conférence et d'autres organisations internationales et régionales ayant une forte présence en Amérique, en Amérique latine, en participant à leurs réunions et en organisant des événements conjoints. En particulier, avec les Fonds des Nations Unies pour l'enfance, l'Organisation des États américains que je viens de citer, l'Institut interaméricain de l'enfant et de l'adolescent, les comités juridiques interaméricains, les Mercosur, l'Agence espagnole pour la coopération internationale au développement, la Cour centraméricaine de justice, la Conférence des ministres de la justice des pays ibéro-américains, le réseau ibéro-américain de coopération juridique internationale, le réseau latino-américain pour le placement en famille d'accueil et l'Association internationale du Mercosur des juges de l'enfance et de la jeunesse. Par ailleurs, sur le plan académique, le bureau a œuvré pour l'échange régional en créant des contacts et en menant des programmes en collaboration avec de prestigieux établissements éducatifs de la région, comme l'Université catholique de Rio de Janeiro, l'Université nationale autonome du Mexique, l'Université catholique du Pérou, l'Université du Chili et l'Université de Buenos Aires. De même, il maintient une relation fluide avec des organisations académiques, comme l'Association américaine du droit international privé, les centres d'études de droit international privé et les centres d'études de droit, d'économie et de politique du Paraguay, les centres de et d'enseignement économique du Mexique, l'Académie mexicaine de droit privé et comparé et l'Association argentine de droit international. Concernant les travaux des organes internes de la conférence, le Bureau pour l'Amérique latine facilite la participation des délégués 
o reunión regional e internacional, Oriente le delegue y les expert para obtener de esa información pertinente y encourage el diálogo regional a través de conferencias telefónicas, de reunión regional y de la preparación de proposición conjunta y de documentos de trabajo por de, de reunión global. La participación activa de delegué de América Latina de la Comisión Especial recientemente creé a augmenté de manera significativa y a contribuir al buen desarrollo de esa reunión en aportar una visión diferente al trabajo de la organización. Il convient de señalar que el trabajo mené por la conferencia en América Latina ha sido posible gracias no solo al soutien del gobierno argentino, que ha mis a disposición un espacio y ha asumido los frais de funcionamiento del bureau, pero también a la generosa contribución voluntaria de otros miembros de la organización que han permitido meter en œuvre des projets de asistencia técnica de la región, a saber, los Estados Unidos, l'Espagne, les Pays-Bas, le Canada et l'Allemagne. Le succès du programme pour l'Amérique latine a été confirmé par la récente ouverture du bureau régional pour l'Asie Pacifique à Hong Kong, à qui nous souhaitons, au nom de la République argentine, le plus grand succès. Il faut reconnaître à l'heure actuelle le succès du projet visant à unifier les normes de droit international privé qui Ce succès repose non seulement sur le travail régional, mais aussi sur l'universalité de cet exercice. Ce point de vue a modifié la vision traditionnelle qu'avaient les forats internationaux dans la conférence, qui a fait preuve d'une grande capacité d'adaptation aux nouveaux défis. C'est pourquoi j'aimerais conclure ces quelques mots avec une spéciale adresse au secrétaire général Van Long, qui va bientôt quitter son poste à la conférence. Depuis 1996, grâce à son remarquable leadership, l'organisation a connu une incroyable étape de croissance et d'universalité. Je souhaiterais, au nom de l'Argentine, le remercier de tout cœur pour son travail et son engagement. Nous espérons pouvoir continuer à compter sur ce précieux conseil. Il ne me reste plus qu'à souhaiter à l'organisation encore 120 années de plus de travail intense et fructueux. Merci beaucoup. Yes, thank you very much, Your Excellency, on this uh, speech on uh, the focus of which was on, on, on Latin America. Uh, and now we turn into another important region, that is the region of uh, Asia Pacific. And I would like to give the floor to uh, His Excellency Rimsky Yun Kwok Keung, uh, Secretary for Justice in Hong Kong. The floor is yours, please. Secretary General Mr. Van Noon, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to join you on this special occasion for celebrating the 120th anniversary of the Hague Conference on Private International Law, and also to have this opportunity to briefly share with you the key development and outreach of the Hague Conference in the Asia-Pacific region. Law, whether domestic, regional, or international, exists to serve the human community. As human societies change, their laws evolve. Over the past 120 years, the world has undergone dramatic changes. Back in 1893, when the Hague Conference held its first meeting, no one could possibly anticipate the invention of the internet, nor foresee the process of globalization and regional integration that has taken place in the past few decades. Notwithstanding the huge changes to the scene in which private international law operates, the Hague Conference has grown in such strength and size, as well as extended its influence in numerous areas of human activities. Indeed, the history of the Hague Conference vividly illustrates the close relationship between the development 
of private international law and the changes our world has experienced. In the 1870s, the pioneers of the Hague Conference were the first generation of lawyers faced with the impact of the industrial era, especially the dramatic intensification of international communications. This sets the scene for the Hague Conference first meeting in 1893. Although the initial key participants were primarily the continental or civil law jurisdictions from Europe, it soon embraced both civil and common law jurisdictions, especially after the coming into force of the statutes of the Hague Conference in 1955. In the 1980s and 1990s, more states, including Australia, the People's Republic of China, PRC, and several Latin American countries joined the Hague Conference. On the turn of the millennium, the work of the Hague Conference was visibly extended to cover jurisdictions in the Asia-Pacific region on top of those in Latin America and other parts of the world. Apart from the setting up of its first regional office in Latin America in 2005, the Hague Conference at around the same time experienced a marked increase of the involvement of Asia-Pacific countries. Sri Lanka, Malaysia, New Zealand, India, and the Philippines all became members of the Hague Conference during the period from 2001 to 2010. Further, the four Asia-Pacific regional conferences held in Malaysia, Australia, the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region of the PRC, and the Philippines respectively in 2005, 2007, 2008, and 2011 witnessed strong participation and keen interest in the work of the Hague Conference amongst both members and non-members within the Asia-Pacific region. As of now, the Hague Conference has become a global forum truly representative of the international community in all important aspects concerning private international law. The Asia-Pacific region is a very vibrant and dynamic region. Jurisdictions within the Asia-Pacific region provide strong momentum for regional and global economic growth. Take the year 2011 as an example. The total GDP of the 10 member states of the Hague Conference in the Asia-Pacific region accounted for around 26.45% of the world's total GDP. Whilst geographically close, jurisdictions within the Asia-Pacific region are very diverse in terms of history, culture, religion, languages, economies, as well as legal system and legal tradition. Within the region, there are both civil and common law jurisdictions. There are jurisdictions whose culture are primarily Western, but also jurisdictions which are cosmopolitan and international. The economic development and immense diversity of the Asia-Pacific region make it even more important to have a coordinated and harmonized network of private international law. Indeed, the greater the diversity, the stronger the need to have a common framework, such as the one provided by hate conventions. Such a network would benefit not only the Pacific region, but the world as a whole. The establishment of the Asia-Pacific Regional Office in Hong Kong is a logical and desirable development in the history of the Hague Conference. It is a natural result of globalization, regional integration, as well as the increasingly important role played by Asia-Pacific jurisdictions in global economy, international trade, and other aspects of human activities. A key objective of the Asia-Pacific Regional Office is to promote the Hague Conference and its convention by increasing awareness of the value of the membership of the Hague Conference and the usefulness of Hague Conventions to the region, with a will to attracting more states in the region to become members of the Hague Conference and state parties to Hague Conventions. Put shortly, 
the Asia Pacific Regional Office will assist the Hague Conference in strategically positioning itself in the world map so as to further enhance its presence and influence in the region, which in turn will facilitate the achievement of the ultimate aim of progressive harmonization of private international. Since 1998, the representatives from Hong Kong have been participating actively in the meetings of the Hague Conference as part of the Chinese delegation. Hong Kong is most honored and privileged to be chosen as the place in which to establish the Asia Pacific Regional. Apart from being grateful for the support provided by the Central People's Government of the PRC, especially the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, may I take this opportunity to again express my gratitude to the Permanent Bureau of the Hague Conference as well as its members for the trust and confidence reposed in Hong Kong. As the Secretary for Justice of Hong Kong, I can assure all of you that Hong Kong is indeed the right place for the regional office and Hong Kong will do her very best to facilitate the work of the Hague Conference. Hong Kong has for years been and will remain a truly cosmopolitan and international city. Her status as an international financial and commercial center, as well as regional logistic hub, hardly requires further elaboration. Equally clear is the fact that Hong Kong is the main gateway to mainland China, one of the key powerhouses of the world's economic engine. Further, and very importantly, Hong Kong is internationally well known for her firm commitment to the rule of law and her truly independent judiciary. By reason of the one country, two systems concept and the provisions in our basic law, Hong Kong continues to maintain our common law legal system after the reunification in 1997. The Herterich Foundation has for 19 consecutive years ranked Hong Kong as the freest economy in the world and the recent report entitled Global Opportunity Index, Attracting Foreign Investment, published by the Milken Institute in March this year, Hong Kong came first amongst the 98 jurisdictions included in the survey. Apart from our economic policy, the rule of law and efficiency of our legal system play an important role to enable Hong Kong to achieve these and other favorable rankings by independent international institutions. As confirmed in our chief executive's latest policy address, it is our government's policy to enhance Hong Kong's status as a regional hub for legal and dispute resolution services in the Asia Pacific region. With our top quality legal profession comprising both local and international law firms and advocates, our truly independent judiciary and our modern legal infrastructure, Hong Kong is well placed to be the regional hub for legal services. Such policy and attributes of Hong Kong would be of considerable value in assisting the Asia Pacific Regional Office in the performance of its function and fulfillment of its objective. As has been repeatedly pointed out, the success of the Hague Conference should not be measured solely by reference to the number of member states signing or ratifying Hague Conventions. The benefits and impact brought about by the Hague Conven Conference go well beyond the formal adoption or implementation of Hague Conventions. As noted earlier, there exist vast diversities amongst the jurisdictions within the Asia-Pacific region. Hague Conventions, which are intended to bridge different cultures and legal traditions are accordingly very useful in providing a common framework for cooperation both for the states in the region and between those states within and those outside the region. The increased membership base in the region will bring about wider representation of a diverse range of legal traditions to the Hague Conference and help develop new instruments better adapted to meet the needs of the Asia-Pacific region by involving the states in the region more actively in the development of new instruments and more generally in the work of the Hague Conference. 
Increasing the number of state parties to the Hague Conventions in the Asia-Pacific region will provide additional opportunity for enhancing certainty and predictability of cross-border private, commercial, and financial transactions and relationship, promoting judicial and administrative cooperation, and reinforcing protection of children and other vulnerable persons in transborder cases covered by hate conventions. Benefits will accrue within the region and also between the states in the region and outside the region. On the whole, the work of the hate conference in the region will certainly raise awareness of issues concerning private international law and provide considerable impetus for change, whether through the means of implementing hate conventions or by way of domestic law reform based on contents of hate conventions. In addition, the progressive harmonization of private international law brought about by the hate conference will in turn help to fortify the rule of law on the international level amongst members and non-members of the Hague Conference within the region. The rule of law, whether on the domestic, regional, or international level, is essential to investment and financial activities as well as economic development. Without putting in place robust domestic and transnational legal infrastructure, including an appropriate framework of private international law, economic factors alone would not be sufficient to sustain the economic growth in the Asia-Pacific region. The Asia-Pacific Regional Office takes its role very seriously. Since its official opening on 13th December last year, the Regional Office has started its outreach by establishing a network with different institutions in the region. Among others, the Regional Office has entered into a Memorandum of Understanding on academic cooperation with Kyushu University of Japan. Similar instruments are going to be made with other institutions in the region. The regional office also provided support to countries in the region and became a focal point by bringing together countries in the region. On 27th and 28th March 2013, the regional office jointly with the Hong Kong government and the Macau government successfully organized a workshop on the 1993 Hate Intercountry Adoption Convention, which was attended by around 40 participants from six countries in the region, as well as international organizations. The regional office will further its outreach by providing support to the APEC workshop on simplified authentication process for production of public documents abroad through the use of the Hate Apostle Convention in Indonesia in late June this year. The regional office is also planning other seminars and meetings. One of them is the plan to organize a seminar jointly with the Asian Society of Notaries Public after its inauguration later this year. Apart from exploring the feasibility of arranging meetings for experts or working groups in Hong Kong, the regional office stands ready to provide full support for the preparation of the fifth Asia-Pacific Regional Conference to be held in the near future. At the same time, the Regional Office is actively looking for ways to strengthen the network with the national organs, central and competent authorities in the region, and to provide technical assistance to them as appropriate, as well as to enhance contacts with other officials, professional bodies, and academic institutions in the region. Ladies and gentlemen, the process of globalization, regional integration, and technological advances will continue. States are becoming more and more interdependent, and there are bound to be even more interaction between people from different jurisdictions. The need to have a coordinated or harmonized framework of private international law becomes even more important. In his speech delivered at his first meeting held in 1893, Mr. Tobias Arthur, the great Dutch scholar and one of the key founders, described the commencement of the Hague Conference as a dream of his youth that has just started on the road to realization. 
for the well-being of our global human society, this dream must continue. On this happy and memorable occasion of the 120th anniversary of the Hague Conference, may I wish the Hague Conference as permanent bureau, as Latin American orig regional office, and the Asia Pacific regional office, every success in the noble task of harmonization of private international law in the many more years to come. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, uh, for these uh, ideas and reflections. Uh, as you will note uh, on the program that you, all of you have in your hands, uh, we will now break for coffee or tea for about 10 to 15 minutes and then uh, continue with a panel discussion uh, where uh, the future of the Hague Conference will be reflected by distinguished uh, uh, panelists and, and the moderator, Peter Trubov. And then on at, at 5 p.m. we will have a, a questions and answers session uh, with the Secretary General of the Hague Conference, that is Mr. Hans van Loon. Uh, but now we will break uh, for, I would tend to say more likely to be a 10 than 15 minute break, but once you hear the bell tone, which you will not hear here, but you will see here outside, uh, please uh, come back and we will continue with the, the panel discussion. The tea and the coffee are served outside in the lobby. Oh, please, served.